On November 10th, the Halifax-based label Leaf Music released a CD that features the marvelous trumpet player Adam Zinatelli. Called 15 Feet Closer to the Sky, this recording showcases premier recordings of new works for trumpet that have been written specifically for Zinatelli or for his friends. Adam Zinatelli is currently the principal trumpet player with the Calgary Philharmonic Orchestra, a position he's held since 2009. He's also been guest principal trumpet with the National Arts Centre Orchestra and La Ville en Dubois, and is a founding member of the renowned Canadian National Brass Project. And joining me here over Zoom to talk about his recording, 15 Feet Closer to the Sky, I am joined by Adam Zinatelli. Hey, Adam, nice to meet you here over Zoom. Hi, Chris. Happy to talk with you. Mm -hmm. uh, before we get to the CD, I was on the Calgary Philharmonic's website, and it looks like this weekend you're going to be joined by Troop Vertigo, which was an acrobatic troupe that was here in Winnipeg last weekend. Have you seen them perform, perhaps in rehearsal? And also, how do you like working with Julian Pelicano, the WSO's associate conductor? You know what? Rehearsals for that concert have not started yet. We're starting our rehearsals tomorrow for uh, for uh, concerts on Saturday. Uh, so I haven't seen this troupe and I haven't worked with Julian Pelicano yet, but I'm really <laughs> looking forward to it. These shows with the circus are always incredible fun. It's hard for us on stage to stay focused on our music yeah. because like all the all the marvelous things that you can see from the audience we can see from even closer up. Right. It's spectacular. Yeah. And it's a, a real exercise in focus for us. Yeah, and I just want to say, enjoy Julian. He's a great conductor and a great personality. So uh, I'm sure you'll Fantastic. have a lot, a lot of fun with him. Uh, so last month, Leaf Music released your CD, 15 Feet Closer to the Sky. This is your debut recording. For debut recordings for trumpet players, I might think they might want to record the Hummel Concerto or the Haydn or the Arturnian. Uh, What made you decide to focus on new works for trumpet? You know, there are so many recordings of all those war horses, Haydn, Hummel, Aratunian, all, all these concertos and so much of the solo repertoire. I mean, like the Hindemith Sonata that everyone's played. You know, I think I play the Hindemith Sonata really well. And I think I have some very uh, insightful original ideas about how to perform that piece. But what's more important for me is like making a project that contributes something. You know, there are so many recordings of all those pieces out there. But on this recording, the thing that makes this a particularly special project is that every second of music on here, it's the first time that any of this repertoire has been recorded. So mm. when you listen to this music, unless you've heard me or my friends play it in live concerts um, in, in far ranging places around the world, um, you, you've never heard any of this music before. And I think that that makes it really special because not only am I you know, getting my performance out there, but I'm also introducing this repertoire to a wider audience, both of the general public who are going to hear this music that's so amazing and so varied. Like it, 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 The sonic uh, content of this album is incredibly wide ranging. Um, but I, another important part of this is that I'm introducing all this repertoire to most trumpet players who have right. never heard this before. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's really important because some instruments like the violin, you know, for example, they have so much repertoire. They could play the standard sonatas and the violin and piano repertoire for, for a lifetime and never run out of masterpieces. Mm -hmm. But right. for the trumpet and for many other instruments, um, that's just not the case. We don't have the quantity of repertoire. And frankly, in general, we don't have the quality of repertoire. Um, I'm sure that there are many pieces out there that I've never heard that are great. But of the standards, you know, you you sort of exhaust your uh, your options fairly quickly. So what I wanted to do um, for the last you know ten or fifteen years was to be always kind of trying to commission new music from composers that I that I found a connection with personally or with their music, uh, and along with a few like minded friends, um, we were all sort of adding piecemeal to our repertoire and playing the pieces that each of us uh, were commissioning as well. And I kind of joked to my friend, Aaron Hodgson, I said, Aaron, one day we're going to have enough of these to make a whole album. And <laughs> we laughed about it. But, you know, lo and behold, yeah. you know, we were actually able to follow through on that. And Aaron's also featured on this album playing mm -hmm. um, a two trumpet piece with me and uh, a trio that also features Miranda Cairns, the second trumpet here in the Calgary Philharmonic and a great friend of mine. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's been really fun to you know live with this and make this thing with uh, especially with Aaron, who's one of my oldest trumpet friends. We met in National Youth Band many, huh. many, many years ago. Um, so to to have this thing that we've made together um, and that the music exists because we were bothering composers 
uh, is really, really special, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Leaf Music is such a fantastic Canadian label. We've been playing them here on the station for some now, some time now. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the recording process for 15 Feet Close to the Sky? What was it like? You know, when I first was thinking about pursuing this project in earnest, trying to find a label was a, a, a tricky part of that because I didn't really know the, the lay of the land, you know, who to contact, all these things. I cold called Leaf Music with this project that I believed in. And uh, Jeremy was just so wonderful. He saw the value in the project um, and he was behind me the whole way. And, and it gave me a great deal of confidence that um, not only that it was going to be great, but th that I wasn't the only person who thought this project was worth doing. You know, mm. um, the actual recording process was grueling as any recording process is. But, you know, the the physical um, constraints of playing the trumpet means that recording sessions have yeah. to be uh, approached very, um, very judiciously. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the way that we managed to do it, I, I, I think, was smart. I think there are lessons learned for next time, but it's all very individual stuff. The um, the actual recording was made by James Clemens Seeley, a fantastic recording engineer who has been the head recording engineer at the BAMF Center. Now he's teaching at McGill. And uh, he and the folks at Leaf Music have a long relationship. So they really trusted James with the the production of this, uh, the the. the engineering this recording that sounds great and i think it does i think this recording sounds mm -hmm. like me which is amazing to, yeah. to have something uh, you know something in in a digital format that actually i think represents my playing in an honest way is incredible yeah. um and yeah leaf knew that we were in good hands with with james so they uh you know they helped us when we needed something but when when we didn't they were happy to let let james drive the bus on uh on making this thing really be uh, the quality of sound that we were looking for. Yeah, it's it's a wonderful uh, sounding CD. Um, the Thank recording you. opens with a great trumpet sonata written by William Rosen. Am I saying that R name right? Rosen, I think. Rosen. Uh, you say in the booklet that you had mutual friends. Uh, can you talk about your relationship with him and how this trumpet sonata came about? Yeah, so Bill was finishing his doctorate at the University of Toronto when I was in my undergrad at the Glenn Gould School. And we, I had a friend who was um, living in the same shared house as Bill, and I happened to hear um, someone playing Bill's violin sonata on their recital at school at, at uh, the Glen Gould School, and I thought it was a great piece. And you know, I was seeing Bill around sometimes because I would go over to you know hang out and all that stuff. And uh, I eventually pinned him down and said, "Hey, I really like your violin sonata. Would you would you consider writing something for trumpet?" And uh, he agreed to graciously. I know he was very busy at the time, but he was willing <laughs> to take one more thing onto his plate. Um, and we had a performance in mind at the Sound Symposium New Music Festival in St. John's, Newfoundland in 2009, 2010, maybe 2010, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and a, a couple of the pieces on this album were premiered at that concert as well. Actually, I think the CBC picked that up and broadcast it on The Signal, a late night classical music show. Um, yeah. so, so maybe, maybe someone can, can dig up those old recordings, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was really a magical experience because, you know, I prepared, I went, uh, out to Newfoundland for that. That's where Aaron was, was teaching at Memorial University there, um, at that time. So I met the pianist that Aaron had been working with to have our, you know, week of rehearsals before our concert there. Yeah. And like, I had practiced the piece. I looked at the score and kind of got it into my brain a little bit. But that first time that we played it together and the music that had been written because I bothered a composer existed as like a physical thing in the world for the first time. It was magical. Mm. It was just magical. And not only because of the process of creation, but also because it's a really amazing piece. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a really amazing piece. And um, like it, that feeling was something that I, I knew I knew immediately, like, I can't stop here. I have to keep doing this because this is amazing and rewarding. And the thing that made me very, very happy for the first time was when I heard another trumpet player who I didn't know playing that Rouse and Sonata. Nice. nice. Yeah. Somehow it got out there a little bit. It's been published and all that stuff. So um, yeah, it's, it's, I hope that this album really accelerates that process of getting this music into other people's repertoire. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I was reading the background story uh, to uh, Gabriel Darmu's piece, Sung in a ri Rickshaw. Yes. It's so great. Uh, can you talk about him as a composer? And also, can you talk about that story a bit? Uh, from what I recall, he it comes from his practicing singing in the back, back of a auto rickshaw when he was in India. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So Gabriel is an Indian Canadian cellist and singer. Uh, also a really amazing drag performer. If you ever have a chance to see his show, it's, it's really, <laughs> it's really something amazing. Lots of stuff on the internet too. Um, so he went to Chennai to study uh, South Indian Carnatic classical music. And when he was there, uh, it, th this piece was commissioned by Aaron Hodgson. He, he uh, bothered Gabriel about this. And uh, he decided to base the piece not on the music he was studying, but on sort of the experience of studying that music and immersing himself in Chennai's music scene and like the reality of trying to like, because Ch Chennai has an incredible music scene. The world's largest music festival is in Chennai. Mm -hmm. um, so he would go from concert to concert to concert on any given night, just because there was so much to soak in. And he would take the little auto rickshaws from place to place it was the best way to get around. And so when he was, you know, between concerts, he would be, thinking about what he heard, he would be trying to figure it out, trying to internalize it. And a lot of that was through uh, his singing, which is part of, you know, the the varied study that he was doing there. Yeah. And he made the piece about that. He made the piece about the experience of being like sort of overwhelmed with the amount of amazing things and trying to figure it out, trying to make it his own, trying to, um, sort of not let this fleeting thing pass him by, you know? So I, I think it's a really amazing piece. I've never encountered anything else like it for trumpet. The, I mean, it's a very technically demanding piece, but the musical challenges of this piece for someone, you know, raised and trained in a Western musical milieu, uh, very unique challenges in this piece that uh, I, I think are, make it really fun to listen to and also have made me a way better trumpet player and musician um, having to work on things that I've never had to work on before. Yeah, I was listening to it. It's very rhythmically challenging. It's yes. reminded me a lot of like Indian, like raga uh, music. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Especially in that middle section, the rhythmic structures yeah. are, are are repeating to our Western ears. It might not be totally, um, uh, totally obvious at first listening, but like rhythmic cells that take like, you know, yeah. four or five seconds, they repeat over and over with the notes all changing and the intensity changing. And uh, it, it, it's it's really quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. The name of the album comes from Eric Nathan, Eric Nathan's four sculptures for two trumpets. Uh, you touched on it uh, earlier. Uh, who is your trumpet duo partner for this? And here we've got a piece of music actually inspired by art, right? Yes, that's right. So these pieces were commissioned, I believe, by Aaron Hodgson, my good friend and collaborator, who's currently the trumpet professor at Western University in London. Uh, and Joel Brennan, uh, a colleague of his, who's now teaching at, I believe, the University of Melbourne in Australia. Um, they were students at Yale together, along with Eric Nathan, who was studying composition, but had been a trumpet player in a previous life. So um, he wrote this piece for them, and it is based on visual art. It's called Four Sculptures. It is based on four physical sculptures that exist by American sculptor Derek Parker. You can find pictures of those on the internet. They're really neat. They're really neat pieces. They're very different from each other, uh, mm. as are the four movements of this piece. Incredibly different from each other in terms of like musical language and also sound worlds. Like the first, um, the first is called 15 Feet Closer to the Sky. It's what gives the album its title. Mm. That sculpture is, it's, it's two, like it's made of metal, but it's like a double helix of these two paper airplanes twirling and ascending skyward um and the music is all very quiet and very fast uh it's with practice mutes in both trumpets it's a very covered strange burbling sort of sound <laughs> yeah, very, very unique i've never heard anything like it the second movement is called submarine egg it is based on a sculpture inspired by the sculptor's time serving in the u.s navy in a submarine mm. and the the sculpture is um, it's a, like a bird's nest with a large sort of like ostrich egg size little squat little submarine in there. And this movement is incredible. It's just incredibly written. The, uh, the two trumpet players take out, take their trumpets apart a little bit. Each one removes a different valve slide. Yeah. So we have the notes using the intact valves 
to play out the bell, but whenever you press that take it apart valve down, the sound doesn't even make it to the bell. The air shoots out the side of the instrument ah. and, it, and it makes a really strange variety of sounds and of pitches. So um, uh, Eric, the composer, uh, uses this effect to make the sounds of gunshots at the beginning. It's just like, ba-doo, ba-doo, like these <laughs> very strange pings. Um, and they sound out of tune because they're, we're playing them out, yeah. out of a taken apart instrument. And that, that's how they're supposed to be. He's, he wants the pitches to just lie where they lie. You get what you get. Mm-hmm. They're not supposed to be in tune. Um, he also, because of the submarine aspect of this, like there are some incredible underwater sounds that are totally ethereal in here. There's one part that sounds like two whales singing to each other almost. And there's a, an amazing part with these like sonar pings that go, <laughs> it's an incredible effect super original i've never heard anything like it it's you know some other composers have written things for taking your instrument apart but the the way it's done in here is very very original mm-hmm. the third movement is called in memoriam it's based on a sculpture called precipice that is uh basically the ch- a chair a single chair at the end of a long plank um it's a very it's very lonely music and it's a very lonely sculpture uh in this movement one trumpet on stage that's Aaron on this recording with a cut mute so a very covered intimate sound and the other trumpet me on this recording playing off stage mm. playing like these very big open sweeping lines whereas the on stage part is much more quiet and introspective it's a really interesting sonic environment in fact when Aaron and I have performed this piece live I remember one time just the way the building was I actually left by a, a fire escape visible on stage and came yeah. back in the building the other way around so the audience didn't worry it was a great effect but it's a very effective movement and i think um capturing that sound of the two totally different spaces uh was tricky on the recording but i I think it turned out really really well Mm -hmm. the last movement is called um i'll take that again the last movement is called going up the downside Uh, the sculpture is of a small boat making its way up like a children's slide from like a playground um, and the music is is very strange. The two parts are wildly different. Uh, one playing very rhythmically, uh, open with no mute. Uh, that's Aaron on this recording. And me playing a much longer line with a harmon mute, making a very kind of nasal sort yeah, of right. sound. It's it's So like, it's aside from each of those movements being amazing, those four being part of one thing is incredible because the contrast is... is it, it, like you think, oh, it's two trumpets. How much variety can there be? Well, listen to this piece, and you're going to be blown away because it's such a such a wide range of sonic landscape. Sure, sure, sure. Um, the CD is really about all things trumpet. Uh, there's two pieces uh, on the disc by Vancouver-based composer Jeffrey Bryan, Legacy and Open and Shut. Legacy is a piece dedicated to his composition teacher, Donald Erb, who was himself a trumpet player. And Ryan got advice from the composition for the piece from Marcus Goddard, who is the associate principal trumpet in Vancouver and himself also a composer. Uh, What is Jeffrey Ryan's writing like for trumpet? Does it lay well on the instrument? Like it must if he's had all these influences, right? Yeah. So Jeff was writing a set of unaccompanied pieces for all the brass instruments, I believe, for for the faculty at uh, UBC in Vancouver. And these pieces were part of that. Interestingly, he wrote Legacy with a sort of a more a larger pool of players in mind. He decided to make the piece not have um, crazy technical requirements or anything like that. Whereas mm-hmm. Open and Shut is a really virtuosic, very difficult piece uh, for all you trumpet players out there. Uh, Jeff has put the music up for free on his website. You can you can Google him or you can Google me. And I've got a link on my website to that too. But you can get this sheet music now. That's another thing. Almost every, one piece, just one piece where we're still working on publishing, but everything else you can get right now and start practicing it. Yeah. Um, so Legacy, uh, I'll take that again. It's interesting working with composers who are not trumpet players because it's an interesting mix of like, well, what works nicely on the instrument? You know, that's one consideration, but uh, and the opposite of that, you don't want to encourage them to go down well-trodden roads. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's it's great to try and find ways to encourage them to do, to, to write their music, to be original, to push the limits, not for the sake of pushing the limits, but to to, to have expression not compromised 
by what's normal on the instrument. So mm -hmm. there are some parts of legacy that are very, uh, very intuitive. You know, leg yeah. legacy is quite an intuitive piece in general, whereas open and shut, the other piece really does push a lot of, uh, a lot of the technical limits of the instrument. There are some things in there where it's like, okay, if the trumpet can do this, you know, this, this little thing, if we take that to the nth degree, it should be able to do that too, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then we, the performers, are left to figure that out. But that's part of the joy of it. Mm. And that's part of the creative act, you know? I think that whenever we're pushing our limits, and I don't mean always higher, faster, louder. It might be um, more nuanced phrasing. It might be having giving more space in a phrase. It might be playing softer. It might be trying to just get an articulation to just to be such a way that a certain phrase spins out exquisitely. All of these things are pushing our limits. And I think that when we're working on those borders, I think that's when we do our best work. I think that's when we make the most compelling art. And mm -hmm. I think that that's when we grow the most as artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, whenever a disc uh, features a soloist comes out, I always think there's sort of these two groups of people who are listening to it. There is the person who's listening to it who plays that instrument themselves and is thinking of it sort of more from an inside uh, standpoint. And then there's uh, the listener who's just uh, listening for, for enjoyment. For trumpet players out there, what do you hope they'll take away with uh, after they've listened listened to the CD? Well, the the main thing is I just want people to be excited to play this music. You know, mm. like I said earlier, um, all of this music can be had now, except mm. for one piece, still working on the publishing. But everything else, like you can be practicing this stuff. You can, you know, if you're in university, you could put this on your recital this year. Right. Anything, anything on on this disc. And I think that that's how you know, th that's how it gets into people's bones. And that's how we we develop a great repertoire for the instrument, you know, like mm -hmm. all these other instruments have great repertoire. We've got to kind of make ours past a certain point. And I think that a lot of these pieces are going to really stand the test of time because they're original, they have depth and mm -hmm. they benefit from repeated performance you know like i've played much of this music since i've recorded it and yeah. i'm still i'm still learning new things i've been playing the rousen sonata for what 15 years now just about and i played it at a cd release recital here for the instrumental mm -hmm. society of calgary and like during that performance i was like oh here if i do this like this breathes better this makes the phrase even you know more expressive than it was before and that's that's a hallmark of great music, you know, sure. something that you play it and you kind of feel like, okay, I've done what I can with that. Let's say goodbye and not really revisit that. You know, that's, that's fine. You might have a nice time, but pieces that you're going to live with for your whole career and play over and over again and keep learning about them and keep finding new insights. Um, I think that's the hallmark of great music. And I think that a lot of the stuff on this album um, will prove to be that for me. Mm -hmm. And what do you think, uh, what do you hope non-trumpet players will take away from this, listening to the CD? Well, I hope they enjoy it. I think it's a really beautiful sounding album. I think the the sonic experience of the album is is really wonderful. And again, very wide ranging because of the, the huge variety of music on here. I hope that, um, I hope that a lot of people change their perception of the trumpet <laughs> because i think a lot of people think of it as a very aggressive uh sort of perfunctory instrument where mm. it's you know you know fanfares and loud things and that's what yeah, it's yeah. for but i really believe that the trumpet's expressive range is unsurpassed by any other instrument i really mm. do you know we hear violin concertos a lot we hear cello concertos piano concertos and they're incredible and we hear singing a lot. And I think the trumpet has more in common with singing than it does with any of those other instruments. Um, but the depth of sound and the nuance of expression is, it's a unique palette. It's a soprano instrument. It's mm. immediately relatable uh, to the voice, I think. And I think that a lot of the things on this album really key into that very vocal approach. But it also has power and it has, um, it can have edge, yes, 
but it could also have incredible softness and glow. So I, I think that um, this album hopefully will change some minds about the trumpet and uh, make people realize that, you know, it can be, it can be as virtuosic, as beautiful, as expressive, as emotional as, as any other instrument can be. You know, I, I don't think there's anything that can beat it. Mm -hmm. Adam, 15 feet closer to the sky is a really great disc. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It is now in our systems here at Classic 107. Uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. This has just been a lot of fun. Oh, thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks for having me.